What are they going to do? They put the rocks right on the blanket. This is France in 2017. The authorities here in France have dismantled the famous jungle camp near Calais. And that means figuring out what to do with the 7,000 migrants who were there. Except for a lucky few, they'll face a long and complicated asylum process, one our observers know well. My colleague Corentin Beignet went to meet them. Mubarak and Omar? I don't have too much cold when it's cold. Tu as froid au Soudan Non. Non, bien sûr. Il ne fait pas froid, il fait chaud. Il fait, il fait, chaud. Il fait toujours, chaud. toujours chaud. chaud. Il fait très, très chaud. Salut Moubarak. Oh, salut. Hi Moubarak. Ici à Quentin. You are observer here in Canton. You're part of a group of migrants selected in Calais to come to this centre. And you're taking intensive French classes. Yes, it's been four months now. I have French classes seven hours a day. I work a lot. And I live here at the centre too. I'll show you around. When French police were dismantling the so-called jungle camp at Calais, Mubarak and about 50 other migrants were selected for this programme because they showed a strong desire to integrate into French society. They were sent to this centre in northern France for language and job training. The programme is designed to showcase French immigration policy at its best. In the north of France, there are a lot of chips. Yes, it's a speciality. They're delicious. Yeah, they're good. They're great. <laughs> this is my room. It's better here in Cantin than in Calais. Here I've got a radiator. I've got heating. I'm not cold. In Calais it's always raining. We're in tents, no blankets. But here it's good. I left Darfur because there is still a lot of war, always war. After that we came to Libya. We worked in the fields. If you went out to a shop, they'd arrest you and put you in prison. And they beat us all the time. I left Libya. I came to Italy and then to France. The programme is designed to prepare the migrants to work in a specific sector when they get out. After your French classes, you're going to get work training, right? Yes, I chose logistics to be an order picker. The training will last four months. Then, if I get my refugee status, I'll look for work. We meet Mubarak a few days later at the French refugee agency outside Paris. This is where he has to go for an interview to obtain refugee status. In 2016, France processed 85,000 applications for asylum. 36,000 were granted. That's about 40%. The figures are growing, but France still takes in fewer refugees than many other European countries. This interview is for you to explain why you fled Sudan and why you are afraid to return. Nothing you say will be repeated to anyone in the Sudanese government, or to your family, or anyone. Translated by an interpreter, Mubarak explains that the land his family worked on in Darfur was claimed by pro-government fighters. One day, they told me that if I came back to my land, they'd kill me. So, Mubarak, how did it go? It was difficult, but I'm happy to have done it. Just 12 days after his interview, Mubarak gets his answer, and it's positive. A 10-year French residence permit. For the first time since his escape from Darfur, he is safe. But in France, not all migrants are as lucky. Our observer Azat from Afghanistan lived on the streets for 17 months before finally getting his refugee status. He now works at a supermarket in Paris. Hi, Azat. Hi, Corentin. How are you? You're getting off work. Yes, I'm done for the day. It went well. Now I'm going to start my second day. I'm going to see the refugees who are camping out at Port de la Chapelle. How long is your contract for? Two more weeks. And then I hope they'll give me a permanent job. Azat brings us to the humanitarian centre, which opened at the end of 2016 in Paris. 
The center is supposed to take in all migrants, except those who were registered and fingerprinted when they arrived in another EU country. They stay for a few days, then get assigned to other centers around France to make their asylum application. But the facility can't handle the demand. Every morning, there's a scramble to get in. There are a lot of people out here. About 150 or 200 who are waiting to get in. There are only 450 places. When people file their application, it goes to the refugee office. They're asked to write their personal history, but many of them can't write French. Aizat learned French in a few months, mainly by himself. For me, it's easy, so I help other people. I speak Pashto, Dari, Hindi, Urdu and English. They had a hard time getting a translation of their application. It can cost 90, 120, 150 euros, just for two or three pages. So I do it for free. They need it. If they come here, they have no money. They don't even have enough to buy food. Azat says that migrants sometimes wait for weeks to have an appointment for their asylum application. They built camps. In February, they were dismantled. They say they've been living here for two and a half months. They were sleeping there. They're on the platform. Yes, they put blankets up for protection so they could get the heat coming up from the metro. But this morning, the police came and told them they were putting it all in the trash. The refugees used to sleep here in tents, but the police put these big rocks in. It's a mess. What are they going to do? They put the rocks right on the blankets. This is France in 2017. This is video of police violence that took place in August 2016. They tear-gassed a lot of people. It was at the Jour metro. You can see them clearly gassing the refugees. Azat fled Afghanistan after the Taliban killed his brother. After two and a half years in France, he now lives at the Salvation Army Center with other Afghan refugees. This is an Afghan speciality. Azat is constantly thinking about his fellow migrants. I think of the guys living on the street. What are they going to do? There are lots of people who've killed themselves in the last two or three months, from Sudan, from other African countries. They committed suicide by jumping from the fifth or seventh floor of a shelter. A few months ago, I was translating an Afghan guy's personal history. He told me the Taliban had tied him up to a tree and then killed his family in front of him. His mother, his two brothers, his two sisters and his father. Right there, in front of him. He was tied up for two days. He told me his mother took three hours to die. She was screaming, but he couldn't help her because he was tied up. It took me two days to write the guy's personal history. It was very hard. I can't do it face to face anymore. Now they write it. And I make a photocopy. The refugee process in France is especially hard for one category, unaccompanied minors. They arrive knowing no one. In Paris, they first have to prove their age at a centre operated by the Red Cross. A dozen or so show up every morning. Most are taken in and get housed and fed, but others are turned away. Our observer Esperance Minard tries to help them. Some of them show up and they're sent right back to the centre for adults, based on how old they look. We've seen kids who have biometric passports plus an identity card from their country, and they don't even look at the documents. You can't decide whether someone's a minor or not based on how they look or act, or just because they have no documents. All of them should be taken in, systematically. We meet Paul, a young man from sub-Saharan Africa, who claims to be 17. He's trying his chances at the centre for the fourth time. 
He agrees to wear a microphone. He tells the staff that he was turned away at the adult center. They told me they don't take in 17-year-olds. I have all my documents. I called the homeless hotline. They said they couldn't help me. At this point, we can't help you. We have no other solution. But five minutes later... OK, I'll register you. Go to this address and you'll have an interview. This time, Paul is accepted, even though he showed the same passport the previous three times. But two other young Africans are not so lucky. Do you have your things with you? No, I don't have anything. Nothing? Not even a backpack? No, nothing. No sleeping bag? No, I have nothing with me. Sometimes I spend the night in Place d'Italie. I find somewhere to sleep. In the metro? Yes, and sometimes I take the night bus. When I get to the last stop, they tell me to get off. The Paris mayor's office says that all unaccompanied minors are taken in, but says there are strict rules for establishing their age. The decision is made after examination of their papers, of how they got to France, and an assessment of their maturity. We have tripled the resources for sheltering young people since November and doubled the facilities at the processing centre. The only recourse for young migrants who aren't taken in is to go through the courts, but legal cases take at least two months. So you need to go on Saturday morning to the place with an association to send a letter to the judge okay. to explain that you don't agree with this decision. In the meantime, the young migrants will sleep outside, relying on Espérance and her group to give them blankets and a sleeping bag. Without a fixed address, they can't enroll for school. One of them tells us that France is very different from the country he'd imagined. That's it for this week. And remember, we need you to help us make this program. You can get in touch with us via Facebook or Twitter or WhatsApp or an email to our site. I'll see you next time.